Hello AP Bio. This is the third of a four-part video series. Again, I'm going to be talking about macromolecules to help you organize and clarify your thinking about the different classes of biological molecules. In this video, I'm going to be talking about proteins. Proteins are one of our more complex or one of the more complex macromolecules. Um, again, I'm going to be talking about this generalized structure, a little bit what to look for. We'll talk about some specifics of the individual building blocks. And then we'll, I'll end by talking about some of the general functions um, with some specific examples to help you connect uh, and remember what some of those general functions are. Okay. So proteins, and here, again, you want to have your notes pack it out. I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to follow along with your notes to help you uh, organize your thoughts. So what to look for if we look at the individual protein molecules, and if we look in those giant macromolecules, biomolecules, the individual elements that are going to be in them, comparing them to the two types of classes of macromolecules that we've talked about so far, they're going to have they're carbon based just like all of our organic molecules and they're all going to have hydrogen in them just like the carbohydrates and just like the lipids now similar to the carbohydrates they're going to have quite a bit of oxygen in them um not as much as the carbohydrates uh, but we got a new player on the scene now we're going to find nitrogen so proteins have nitrogen in them and we'll also see in some proteins we're going to see some sulfur so if you see a, a big molecule with a bunch of nitrogen in it and maybe some sulfur that's a carbon-based molecule, you you're, could be likely looking at a protein. But let's talk a little bit about the general structure. I'm going to bounce back and forth and look at the, the, the polymer structure, the, the collection of individual building blocks, and then I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about the individual building blocks. But we'll start uh, talking about the general structure. Now, the interesting thing about proteins, like I said, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And the three-dimensional structure of proteins can be broken down into four different levels, and they're named for their four different levels. It's not creative. We have the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and the quaternary structure. Let's talk about each one of those. The primary structure is going to be a sequence of monomer units. The monomer unit of the polymer that we call proteins is uh, our amino acids. We also call them polypeptides. So let's re record that down here just so we follow along with your notes here. The monomer unit of, of proteins are amino acids. The amino acid single building block unit can also be called a peptide. And just as a foreshadowing for what I'm going to talk about in just a second, there's 20 or 21 different amino acids, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But we have this primary structure. We think of it as the sequence of amino acids, and different proteins are going to have different sequences of these 20 different types of building blocks, but they're all amino acids. Now, each of these amino acids are going to be joined together. We know, all, like all macromolecules are going to be joined together by the process of dehydration synthesis, and that's going to form a covalent bond. The specific covalent bond in uh, polypeptides, the long chains of amino acids, the long chains of peptides, are going to be called peptide bonds. Again, not particularly creative. That's the primary structure, and you can see a diagram of what the primary structure looks like here. It's just a long chain of monomer units. Now, the secondary structure is what you see right here. There's two different general secondary structures. There, you see here, this, uh, this is called an alpha helix, and this accordion right here is called a beta pleated sheet. Now, we get alpha helices and beta pleated sheets because, what's ha uh, because of what's happening at these individual peptide bonds. And we're going to talk a little bit about, more about them in a second, but they, each of them has nitrogen and oxygen at this bond right here, right in close proximity to this bond. And because of those, because of the electronegativity, the high electronegativity of oxygen and the high electronegativity, relatively high, of nitrogen, you're going to get partial charges at each one of these peptide bonds. And when you have partial charges due to differences in electronegativity, you get our friend, the hydrogen bonds. And so we get these repeating patterns because we have a repeating pattern of hydrogen, uh, of hydrogen bonding here, here, 
here, here, here. And then we, these are the repeating patterns we get. We get curl, 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 curl. That's called an alpha helix. Or we get zigzag, 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 zigzag. That's a beta pleated sheet. Now there's different combinations in, of alpha helices and beta pleated sheets that's outside the scope of this class. Now the next level of uh, structure is the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is just the 3D folding. So if we look at this diagram in here, all it's showing us is the primary structure is just these individual sequences. And then you see in here these beta pleated sheets, that's the red arrows, that's what that's showing you. And the uh, alpha helices, that's these curly cues. You can see there's both of those secondary structures in there. And then the whole thing is folded into a three-dimensional shape. Now, just like what I've been talking about since the beginning, the very beginning of the year in our first couple of classes, structure is really important to proper functionality. So the folding of a protein is important um, so that it functions correctly. So before the protein is folded correctly, we call it a polypeptide because it's a polymer of peptides, right? Joined by peptide bonds. And when it's fully functioning and fo when it's fully folded correctly and it's fully functioning, we call it a polypeptide. I mean, we call it a protein, but not until it's fully functioning. So this is what is showing you that, that 3D structure. All proteins are going to have these 3D, uh, I mean, uh, of these three levels of structure. Now, the 3D folding, the reason that proteins fold correctly is because of what we call the R group. And the R group is associated with the monomer unit. Each different of the, the 20 different amino acids all have a different R group. And because that R side chain can be different, we get different kinds of bonding that is that causes the different specific three-dimensional folding. We, sometimes we have covalent bonding in there. Sometimes we have ionic. Sometimes we have disulfide bridges because some of the R groups have sulfur in them. And they're all going to fold in a particular way. I'm going to talk about it in a second. It'll make a little bit more sense. And we'll work with some models in class. So that will make a little bit more sense. But for now, just... That, that's enough for right now. Okay, so then let's go to the quaternary structure. Some proteins, not all proteins, also have quaternary structure. And what that means is that polypeptides are going to come together into complexes. So you have multiple proteins, or polypeptides, I should say, that have primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. And then they're going to come together with multiple interactions, types of bonding interactions. Often they're hydrogen bonding because they're flexible, and they make these protein complexes. And the proteins, uh, the polypeptides uh, that, that are 3D folded don't work alone. They only work when they're in these complexes. An excellent example of this is hemoglobin, which you all likely know about because that's the uh, protein that delivers oxygen to invertebrate uh, blood. And here's a hemoglobin right here. Now, hemoglobin, you can see here, is composed of four subunits. They're all polypeptides. They all, all four of them, have primary secondary and tertiary structure. And it just so happens that they're called globin proteins or globin proteins. And this is, there are two of what are called alpha globins and two beta globins. And they all form this complex right here that, and it doesn't work if they're just floating around alone. They have to be all bound together to properly de de, uh, deliver oxygen to all parts of your body. So hemoglobin has quaternary structure. Not all proteins have quaternary structure. They all have primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Okay, let's go back to your notes page right here, and let's just clarify that there are 20 different amino acids that are going to make up this primary structure and that are going to be uh, involved with uh, proper structure of proteins. Let's talk a little bit more about those 20 different uh, amino acids, those 20 different monomer units. This is from your textbook, uh, or a similar diagram in your textbook, and you can see here that there's, well, 21 actually. These are the different amino acids, the different peptides, and these are sorted by their, um, the differences between them. Now, every single amino acid is going to have the same basic structure. And we'll talk about why it's named an amino acid right now. You can draw one of these in your notes. You might want to pause it for just a second. Let's look and see. Let's look at an easy way to draw it. We have a chiral carbon right here. And the reason it's chiral, remember this, that they can have enantiomers, chiral carbons, and because they have four different things, four different uh, elements bound to them. And in the case of amino acids, they're going to have an amine group and a hydrogen. 
and then they're going to have a carboxyl group. This uh, uh, this hydrogen dissociates into solution when it's an aqueous solution, which biology is wet, so it always dissociates into solution. It makes a carboxylic acid. That's why it's called an amino acid. And then at the fourth position, because all carbons have four bonds, we have what's called the R group. That R group is a side chain, and that's what makes every amino acid different. So all amino acids are going to have an amine group, the hydrogen, and the carboxyl group. And then this is different in all uh, of the 20 or 21 different ones. And so you can see them here. This is showing you, here's the amine, and it's not showing you the carbon right there. And here's the carboxyl group. And then these are the different side chains. There's one side chain, there's another, there's another, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. You have 21 different amino acids. Here's is showing you a simplified diagram of the amine group the carboxylic acid group, and then that's that variable side chain. So that side chain is what's involved with the different chemical properties of that side chain are what caused that the, or what determine the three-dimensional structure, the three-dimensional folding. And the different R groups are gonna have different uh, properties. Some of them are charged, some of them are polar, some of them are nonpolar, so on and so forth. Okay, now let's talk about, let's end by, with talking about some major functions and some specific examples of proteins. Let's just say out loud that proteins are a rock star. They do all kinds of things. They are, we're gonna constantly be talking about proteins. One of the big functions of proteins is structure. You basically, and living organisms are basically a walking, talking protein. So there's a lot of you that is acellular, I mean, it's not composed of cells, it's actually composed of proteins. But proteins are doing a lot of other things as well. So for example, if you pull your skin away from your hand, pinch the skin on the back of your hand and pull it away, and, you, and it's, it goes right back, right, where it was. It goes, it's like it's elastic. And the protein that makes that happen is, that makes, that results from that is a protein called elastin. That's the protein in skin. Now, another protein uh, that is sort of looks like a screen, like a screen door almost, uh, that's a protein fibrin, and that's, uh, the stru structural part of scabs, ew, scabs are gross, or touch your hair, the protein that's involved with, that's, uh, is built, your hair, your hair isn't built of cells, it's built of proteins, and uh, the protein is a long chain protein that's called keratin. Proteins are also important for metabolism. Metabolism is cell process, so they make cell processes go, and the types of proteins that make cell processes go are proteins called enzymes. And enzymes are just biological catalysts, so they make reactions go faster. If reactions don't go fast enough, then they can't sustain life, and then we're not living. So non-living, that's not good. Um, uh, in any case, some um, common or some important uh, enzymes are kinases. Those are going to add phosphates to different molecules. That's really important for making reactions go. And phosphatases, those are going to remove phosphates. So the addition and the uh, subtraction of phosphates is going to make reactions. Those are going to turn reactions on and off. They're really important. Another important function of proteins are uh, as a communication molecule. So there are many hormones that are protein hormones, like the fight or flight response. That's a protein hormone. You guys know that as adrenaline. So an adrenaline rush all of the things associated with adrenaline rush, those are the result of a protein. Adrenaline, epinephrine, circulates throughout your body and it tells your body to do all kinds of things. So not only is the signaling molecule uh, adrenaline, but also the molecule that hears that adrenaline signal in a lot of your cells uh, are called G-protein coupled receptors. It's a whole class of uh, proteins that are embedded in cell membranes and those are also involved in cell to cell communication and organismal communication. So they're really, proteins are a really important part of the communication part in multicellular and unicellular organisms. And then finally, proteins are really important in defense and protection uh, against different pathogens. For example, antibodies that are part of your acquired immune system. You've heard of antibodies before. They're part of the, the part, the smart part of your immune system. It's a little Y-shaped protein that swarms pathogens and sends all kinds of signals that says, hey, uh, you're an invader. I've seen you before. I'm going to kill you. And so that's why you can't get the same, um, or I'm going to, I'm going to find cells that can, um, kill you or get rid of you anyway, depending on, we'll talk more about the immune system, but it's important, they're an important component of immune system. Whoa, that's it for now on proteins. We'll talk more about it in class. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know.